Well, good evening, everyone. Just as everyone settles in and logs on, uh, I want to just take a moment. I want to just take a moment to uh, welcome you all to the Love Addiction, Love Avoidant talk. Uh, and before I start, I'd like to um, let those of you who don't know me know that my name is Diane Young. And I'm speaking tonight as a representative of South Pacific Private Hospital, which is on Sydney's northern beaches in Curl Curl. I'd like to begin by paying my respects to the local Indigenous people of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of this land we're meeting upon today. And in fact, it was a client of mine who reminded me that it would be a very good thing to uh, welcome, do the welcome to country. And I'm very glad that she reminded me of that. In uh, 2019, I went over to the Meadows uh, in Phoenix, Arizona, and was given the opportunity to do the Love Addiction, Love Avoidant workshop, which had been written by Pia Melody. Uh, and her work, of course, as many of you know, is very groundbreaking. Uh, it, it was trailblazing work in and of its day, and in many ways it still is. So the group incorporated group therapy, of course, and education and process work. And I went over as a woman uh, who won't see 50 again, and uh, thought, look, I know quite a bit of stuff around this, you know, there's probably not a lot I'm going to learn, but it's going to be an interesting experience. And I sat in a room with six clients and a therapist, and did my work around my love addiction and my love avoidance. And I was so inspired by it, I came back to South Pacific and said, we've got to do this. And then of course, what happened was COVID. And uh, so there's been a little hiatus in getting it together. But, but more recently, we have now commenced to run love addiction and love avoidance workshop at South Pacific. And this is a workshop where it's uh, looking at the way we do relationships post recovery. For those of you that are listening that are uh, in recovery already, you'll know that not, not only do we address whatever substance issues we've got and our mood disorders, depression and anxiety, we can often actually get into recovery around those things after doing some work around them. And then what we will discover is that we'll start having hiccups in our relationships. Now, love addiction, for those of you that don't know, uh, is where we're attracted to a person who is walled in, appears powerful, and we enter the relationship in the midst of a fantasy about the other person. That is, we make up who the other person is and we feel very euphoric. If you're a love addict and you fall in love, it's like in many respects, some people would say you're in love with being in love and you become obsessed with the other person. We usually deny any red flags and we certainly don't acknowledge that the other party, the other partner that we're in relationship with may be walled in or may, may distance from us. What will happen in the cycle, and I'm going to come back to this in a moment, but I, I just want to broadly talk about this. What happens in the cycle is there will be something that disrupts the love addict's denial. And then we will start to enter the withdrawal phase of the fantasy. Now, the interesting thing about people who are in this cycle, if you're a love addict, if you identify with a love addict, uh, you will actually not go into any sort of recovery until you're in that withdrawal phase because it's all fabulous, fabulous, fabulous. Usually then what happens is you'll navigate your way through that somehow and then you'll uh, use strategies to return to the fantasy, medicate the emotional upheaval, however you do that, and that could actually be very obsessive with them or with any sort of other substance abuse. And then you try and uh, navigate your way back in to get the partner back in. You return to the partner and make up the fantasy again and it's all tickety-boo or you will move on to another partner and move on to the fantasy about someone else. Now, the interesting thing about the love addict is the love addict comes from 
living in a family system as a child where you are a lost, what we would call the lost child. Now, if you are the lost child, you will have experienced quite a lot of abandonment and, and neglect as a child. Uh, you will uh, grow up in a family system where you know you need someone, you actually believe you can't do it alone, and you feel like, uh, to quote, and I put quotes around this, you feel like you'll die or you'll fail if you don't have someone in your life. In terms of the love avoidant, the other side of it, they come out of a enmeshed situation or parentified situation with a parent where they adopt the role of the hero or the scapegoat. Those children learn that they have to take care of needy people. Now, you understand that enmeshment means if the parent's here and the child's here, the energy goes from the parent to the child. So if the child's rooted in a stable, safe environment, they are nurtured and guided into adulthood. In an mesh situation or parentified, the energy goes from the child to the parent. So it's all about, I've got to keep mum calm. Uh, I need to look after her. I need to protect her from dad whatever we make up and so I learn as the enmeshed child in the hero or scapegoat role that it's my job to take care of mum i.e needy, needy people that I have guilt if I don't take care of them or if I say anything negative about them and at the same time as we grow up into adulthood with that same trauma within us we will believe that if I get too close to someone, I will suffocate or die. So in other words, you can't win. The love avoidant, uh, you know, comes out of being the hero or the scapegoat in the family system. And the love addict comes out of being the lost child. Now for years and years, when I was working with clients, I would, you know, there was various different roles that we believe people played and they may well play many other roles as well. But when we're working at this depth, we're actually working with those three roles. And the interesting thing for me, and the, the game changer for me, was when I when someone said to me, well, what role did you play in the family? Well, I would have said, oh, well, I was a lost child. But then I would flip-flop in my relationships. And it was only when I did this work at the Meadows that I actually discovered that I played two roles. I was the lost child for my mother and I was a scapegoat for my father. So you see, when you're in the love addiction, love avoidance cycle, you can flip flop into both. And if you've played both roles, you can flip flop all the time throughout your relationships. And depending on the timing of the relationship and where you are in your life when you enter the relationship will depend on whether you go in as an avoidant or an addict. Now, one of the things I learnt um, about myself, I was from an alcoholic family, so I would have said to you that my role as a lost child was the paramount one. But interestingly enough, when I did the processes that I had to do, that was asked of me at the Meadows, I discovered that there was one or two events with my father where I was totally enmeshed and parentified, only one or two, not a whole lot. I mean, he was absent a lot of the time. And they really shaped the way I then moved through my recovery and into my adult relationships. So it can be quite deep, this work. And that's one of the reasons when we're working with people at South Pacific, we want them to have some recovery on board. Perhaps very wise to have done changes, you know, the childhood trauma uh, workshop before we get to this one. So, um, let me just explain. I want to show you a, a picture of something that comes out of uh, Pia Melody's work, and this shows the cycle. So let's be clear. The love, the love addict, the greatest fear that they have is of abandonment, consciously. 
unconsciously their fear is of intimacy. The love avoidance greatest fear, conscious, is of intimacy, unconscious is of abandonment. So you see how it actually mirrors each of them. They each mirror each other. So if you're going to be in, you're in any, either or, you, it's very hard to not actually end up in a relationship with somebody who's, if you're the love avoidant, you're going to end up with a love addict, you're a love addict, you're going to end up avoidant. Although I was talking to somebody just earlier who said to me that she's in a relationship with two avoidants. So she, she reminded me that love addiction is like Romeo and Juliet. They were both love addicts, right? What happened? They both died. And love avoidant, I can remember somebody said to P. A. Melody in a question, well, you know, you know, um, can two love avoidants be in, um, in a relationship together? She said, yes, one lives in New York and the other one lives in Texas. Well, I don't think it's quite that bad, but I just I laughed. I thought he wasn't happy with the answer, by the way. But anyway, that's another story. So I want to just show you this and I, and I hope you can see it because what it shows is this is the the cycle they mirror one another so for example this is the love addiction cycle so you start you enter the relationship and you're responsive to the seduction of the avoidant and you enter in a, a haze of fantasy that is you make up that they are a certain sort of person you you in your mind you make up that oh he's this or she's that or they're that after a while, you, de you deny the partner's walls and the importance of life outside of a relationship for them. You experience an event that shatters your denial. You go into withdrawal from the fantasy. Now, this is pain city for a love addict. I was talking to a gentleman today who's just come out of a love, addi love addiction cycle. And uh, the partner that he was in relationship with was saying no, no, no. He didn't want to have any. He, he said to me, um, I couldn't, I, I couldn't, I couldn't say no. And then when I got the no, I couldn't accept the no. And it made a lot of sense to me when he said that. I said, I'm going to quote you tonight when I talk. You obsess and medicate when you're the love addict, and then you return to the fantasy, and so it goes round. In no time are you in self-care at no time are you putting yourself first at no time are you asking for your uh, uh, authentic needs to be met if you're in the love addict cycle now in the love avoidance cycle you enter the relationship out of duty not love now that's a shock for some people when i say that to them but if you've been in the love avoidant cycle which is you your job is to take care of needy people and you have guilt if you don't do it and if i get close to someone i'm going to suffocate and die you will actually go in as duty and that's a very hard thing to hear you enter behind a wall of seduction. So you look very much like you're present in the relationship, flapping the feathers, it's all good, you're very present, uh, but it's a wall of seduction. And that impedes intimacy. Remember, the avoidant is terrified of intimacy. You become overwhelmed by the neediness of your partner and you move from the wall of seduction to the wall of resentment and anger. And then you start to push away. You abandon the relationship in some way. You create distance from your partner. And then what you do as the avoidant is you create a tense intensity outside the relationship. Now that will either be uh, an emotional affair with someone, you'll be intriguing with somebody, or you'll have an affair, or you'll get very busy with work. You know, there's a big project on, I've got to get it finished. You know, you're absent for a good while more than you normally would be from home. And then when the partner, when the love addict picks up on this and starts to move away from you emotionally, you'll actually want to return to the relationship out of guilt or out of fear of being abandoned. And then you'll move back into the relationship again or you'll actually leave that and create another relationship. So the cycle goes around and around and around. The interesting thing is that the love avoidance 
when they start to get awareness, they will go into a recovery a lot earlier. They do know, they have a sense of being separate. Uh, and um, as I said, the love addict doesn't go into recovery or even acknowledge that there's problem until they're in the withdrawal phase. So in terms of the cycles, you can have two love addicts, you can have two love avoidance. Individuals tend toward one more pronounced and can use the other as a coping mechanism. So you flip into one and flip, flip over. And I think we do that as we get older and more sort of sophisticated about how we do our relationships. If someone was both enmeshed and abandoned, they will flip flop between addict and avoidant depending on the time of life that they're entering this relationship, who shows up and what stage the relationship's at. Now, the interesting thing also for me is this can apply to friendships and romantic involvements. And I don't know if it's happened to you where you've had a good friendship with someone and suddenly they've disappeared or they want to stop talking to you or all sorts of strange stuff happens. You've got no idea, you're totally blindsided by it. And it's because you've been in some cycle with them in the love addiction love avoidance cycle even if it's not an intimate sexual relationship in terms of the avoidant the first thing that the person has to do is identify that they're in the cycle uh, and that's the, their way of being relational when we work with them in south pacific we ask them to do some work about um, past behaviours, not only past relationships, but past sexual relationships. Um, and we actually ask them to look at how they engage in their relationships, how do they go into the relationship, how do they get out of it. We do a lot of shame reduction work and reparenting of the part of the self that feels that they have to be the caretaker. So question from Mike has been, uh, can you be both love, love addict and love avoidant? Yes, you can, but you'll, be one, you'll go in one more one way than another and maybe flip. And if you're in the dance with somebody else, the love addiction, love avoidance cycle will start. Uh, if you are familiar with, uh, I'm guessing quite a few of you will be familiar with the Pia Melody model of developmental immaturity, and the love avoidant particularly needs to work on personal boundaries instead of walls. And in fact, the client I was talking about earlier that told me about he couldn't even know, or he can now, but he couldn't before, was, it was about boundaries rather than walls. Uh, boundaries allow the avoidant to be more real, that is authentically who they are, uh, not who the love addict wants them to be. And, and not to project onto the partner and to also understand that uh, love is not duty. And that's, um, you know, we, we often say in 12 step recovery, love's an action. You know, it's a, it's a verb, it's not a noun. Moderation has to be addressed uh, to enable the avoidant to connect back to natural spontaneity. So there's a lot of ways that we can really monitor our behaviour as we go into relationships or try and heal the ones we're in. The treatment of the love addict, um, as I said, they have to be aware that they're in that cycle of addiction. They're getting a lot of hits off their relationships and it doesn't matter how many they are, they'll keep going. Uh, they need to do their written work about past behaviours also. Uh, and they need to, they actually need to grieve the loss of the fantasies they've been in. And when they have a good look back at their history, they'll actually find that most of the people they were in relationship were not who they thought they were. This will keep people in abusive relationships longer also if they don't get really authentic about who am I in a relationship with. Again, we need to do the shame reduction work and reparenting of the part that feels worth less than others and able, unable to self-care. 
So the love addict needs to focus on core issue one, learning to love the self, which is self-esteem. And the recovering love addict must also lean to care for the self, both in needs and wants. Do you know, it's very interesting when I'm running groups of South Pacific and I often, uh, you know, when we're checking in the morning and I say, has anybody got any needs? Do you know what, you know, and they all go, everyone looks a bit blank. What? Because we get what we want in life a lot of the time, but we don't get what we need a lot of the time because we don't know. We can't distinguish the difference between our needs and our wants. So there's uh, help available. Love addiction is, is, okay, question again, why is love addiction so painful? Well, it's painful when you're coming out of the denial of where you've been. And because when we go in as a love addict, it's like we will give up everything to keep that person. That person, if they're avoidant, they're actually in the relationship out of duty, not love. So we're stymied either way. And when we start to, when a love addict will come out of, start to come out of a relationship, there's been problems with it, they come out of the denial about who they're in relationship with, they will find that they feel enormous pain, anger, shame and fear uh, in a way that they never have. So if you go back for a minute, if I can just answer this another way, when we're little, and we're raised in a dysfunctional family system where we are either enmeshed with a parent or neglected and abandoned or a mixture of both. I mean, you can be neglected by one parent and enmeshed with another. I mean, that means you get the full Monty, really, if that's happen happened to you. You will carry all of those childhood wounds and trauma into your adult relationships. Now, it might be fine when you're a teenager and it's all bang and whatever, but when you start to get into adulthood and you're wanting to have uh, committed relationships, maybe have a family, whatever, you're going to be in a world of pain if you can't actually be authentic, you're authentic with yourself in the relationship and part of you actually understands that the other person isn't either. And it's not because anyone's deliberately trying to be in subterfuge or dishonesty, it's because they have to go back to the beginning of their life and have a look at how they were parented and what roles they played. So that's why it's so painful. Do you know, when I was doing one of the processes in, um, the, in Phoenix, um, you know, the therapist sits very close to you as you're doing your work with your parent, whoever it is you've got to do your work with. and. Um, and I was feeling pretty strong. I was in a really solid group, you know, six therapists all knew their stuff pretty well. Uh, and I found myself going back to one particular event when I was little where my parent, where my father parentified me. And I can remember feeling uh, uh, like it went straight through me, like, like a cut through like a knife. And you know, this sort of cry came out of me that I wasn't expecting. I don't think she was expecting it either because I could feel her jump when it happened. And I thought, this is what this work does. It gives us an opportunity to go back to the past, reframe it, do the shame reduction work, speak the truth, speak from a place of our truth, not to manipulate or control someone else, not to blame anybody for what's happened to us, but to actually say, this is what happened to me and about that I feel this. And that's one of the most freeing things you can do. I, in my experience, it's one of the most freeing things I've been able to do. So you go back really from a place of curiosity and genuine interest in what shaped me to be the woman I am today and to live in the way I do today. Uh, another question is, does this Oh, why do some people never get into a relationship and never have a relationship well? The downside of avoidance, if you've been very uh, badly uh, enmeshed, is you will go into what I call, well, we call in, in certain circles, intimacy anorexia. So that there's a terror in actually getting close to someone you know the word intimacy and you all know this, I'm sure, into me, I see. So if I get close to you, I allow you to see into me. 
I get allow you to see who I am, the parts of myself I don't like. Uh, and it's very terrifying for those people who've never been able to actually be intimate with themselves first, which is what all that work I was talking about earlier really is. It's like going back to the part of yourself that was very wounded, reclaiming that part, giving back the shame that's not yours, and then nurturing yourself to move into doing relationships a different way. That's my belief about what it is. It's because the fear is at the toxic level of terror that I won't get into a relationship because I'm frightened. I'm so terrified of what you will do to me that I won't even try. And even if I put my toe in the water, I'll take it out quick smart. I'll do something to sabotage it so you don't come anywhere near me. Uh, the, next, the other question is, um, does this apply to gay relationships too? Absolutely, it applies, it applies to all of them, it doesn't matter. Whatever sexual persuasion you are, whatever gender uh, you identify with, same, same. It's all to do with what role did we play when we were little and how we then acted out in our adult life. Uh, how do I recognise a lover <laughs> addict or a lover pointer? Well, that's interesting you should ask that question. Because um, the love addict usually comes in very quickly. I'm talking about the unrecovered ones, right? So they come in quickly. They're, they're right into it. You've been on two dates. You know, they're moving the lounge in. You know, it's like it's all on. We can, you know, have babies. We can do this. We can travel there. It's like, hang on a second. I don't even know what your last name is yet. You know what I mean? It's like they're full on, full on, full on. The avoider, they're more subtle because they will come in like, un do you remember earlier I said, they come in under the wall of seduction. So they look like they're very present. They, but the, the, the thing to watch out for an avoider is, are you trying to take care of me? Are you trying to fix me? Are you trying to, do you think I need you, right? And if I don't need you, for example, because I, you know, I like you, I want you, I want you in my life, that's great, but I don't need you, Let's see how they react when uh, I let them know that I don't need them. That's usually the two easiest ways. I also think that if you've done your work and you know who you are and what you want in your life, you'll sense a red flag in your gut. You'll sense something that's not right here. There's something not right here. You always put yourself first and you always ask the question, even if you don't want to hear the answer. Okay, so um, I hope that helps. Uh, the next question is, how do you break this cycle and what steps should we take? Books, okay. Well, the Pia Melody book, uh, let me see if I can quickly put my hand on it, I can. Facing Love Addiction by Pia Melody, great book, covers everything that I've been saying and much more. But the beautiful thing about this book is that at the end, in uh, part five, four, part four, journaling exercises for recovery. So it's, look at, look how much it is of the book. And they give you, she gives you a lot of things to actually write Right, do a first step on love addiction, love avoidant, uh, and other exercises about how you do your relationships. If you've not done anything on codependency at all, which is the underpinning of all, I'd, I'd read this one. Sorry, Facing Codependency, both by P and Melody. They're the best ones to buy. There's a whole lot of other stuff out there, but I think they're the ones that I would go to. Um, and of course, you know, if you really want to have a very close look at your history, uh, I wouldn't be, I would suggest you ring South Pacific and go and have a look, have a chat to them about doing some work in that love addiction, love avoidant workshop. You work in a closed group of six over five days. And, uh, you know, it's pretty extraordinary work if you, if you want to do the work. <clears throat> Don't have to go into the hospital per se, you can go home in the evenings and you do a lot of homework and stuff like that, but it's very, very liberating. Um, 
I also want to just say to that person about how do you break the cycle. The cycle is about getting very current with yourself, learning to speak up for yourself if you're a love avoidant and a love addict, uh, learning to be um, uh, reparent that part of yourself that's wounded. I do believe uh, hope is you know it's it's possible to. Um, walk free of this and if you're in a relationship with a partner that has any emotional intelligence or psychological knowledge they and they work with you you can move through this um, so there is hope is what I want to say to you uh, next question why would I ignore so many red flags in someone and justify them all from day one and now being separated see them all well yeah so when the red flag comes, if we're love addict, we're so in it, we ignore them. And I believe we ignore them, not because we're naive or silly or stupid or anything like that, but because we've been conditioned to not notice the red flags. We've been conditioned from our childhood to not see it. But having had the relationship end and now some perspective on it, now starting to see it. And of course, you know, you and I both know that the test is not what someone's like when they're in the relationship, although sometimes that's not great either. It's what are they like when you're moving out of it? How do they behave? And that'll often wake us up. So if you've been woken up and you're now separated, uh, as painful as that probably is for you, I imagine that maybe a blessing in the long run because you won't get into the same one again question does love addiction love avoidance have anything to do with allowing oneself to get into bad habits whilst in a relationship and requiring a breakup to sort those problems out hmm. I wouldn't say it's about getting into bad habits whilst in the relationship I would say however if I can reframe it it may be more about Accepting unacceptable behaviour, naively thinking we can change someone, and allowing ourselves to put their needs before us. Well, uh, often I hear clients say that you know they stay in relationships because they're actually terrified of being alone. By the time they get to make that statement to me, they're usually ready to start making a change. So there can be layers of this stuff, which is why when we're working with it, we need to have done some earlier tra trauma work before we get to this. I don't believe you can just go straight into this. I think there's got to be some other work before and you have to have clarity around what happened in your childhood. It's not impossible after a breakup to sort them out either if you both make a commitment to get in a recovery. I think anything's possible if you both can wake up and not be asleep in the relationship. Uh, question, <clears throat> could this type of love addiction or avoidance be something that transpired to relationship with adult children when you were no longer in a relationship for a long, long time, which was abusive? Transpired in relationship with adult children. Uh, I'm a, a little unclear on that question, but I think what you mean is uh, I think you mean you've been in relationship with an adult child. So when we're talking about adverse childhood experiences from when we're little, if you are, you know, and the studies are in and um, those of us who have been a game for a while already knew them anyway, but if you're in, if you're raised in an alcoholic or addicted family system, and that can be addicted to anything, alcohol, drugs, gambling, sex, food, uh, and or you're raised in a family system where there's a lot of mental illness, depression, anxiety, any sort of schizophrenia or anything like that, the outcome for the child is the same. So they end up uh, in, a, in a situation as an adult person trying to have a relationship as an adult, but still in fact carrying from the past their trauma. 
So in fact, even though they might be, you know, 25 and trying to have a relationship, they've actually got the emotional makeup of a 15 year old or a 14 year old and they can't work out how it doesn't gel, how the relationships don't gel. I hope I've answered that question. I'm sorry, it was a little unclear to me. Uh, why should you not get into a relationship in the first year of sobriety and 13 stepping in the room? Well, that's pretty obvious. So if you don't get in a relationship in the first year, you won't have to come through the mess that it may well be, end up in. And also because when we're in our first year of relation, first year of recovery from whatever addiction it is, we want to give ourselves the best possible shot. We start getting in a relationship with someone very quickly, you make them their higher power. You may not have had enough time to do any work on your childhood stuff because you're going to do your 12 steps. Uh, and trust me, if it's got any legs, the relationship will be there when you're in your second year or third year or whatever it is. Uh, and 13th stepping in the room is no go because you don't want to actually be doing harm to anybody else in the rooms, never mind about yourself. So I can remember somebody said to me years ago, and I'm talking decades and decades ago about 12 step. You know, if you, when you're in the rooms, you know, you think of all the men and the women in the rooms as brothers and sisters. And you, you know, this is a broad comment, I grant you, but it was like, would you, would you want to actually do anything to harm your brother and sister? Now, some people would, of course, but as a general rule, no, they don't. So let's just try and, you know, the we of the program, you know, we are powerless over whatever we're powerless over people, places, things, substances, food, whatever it is. The we of the program is so important because that, that will be the thing that enables us all to move forward together. We, we recover together. We do not recover in isolation. So we work with that. And that's not to say we're not all, we're not all perfect and I get that, so, you know. What's the difference between needs and wants and how to express them? What you need is what is going to centre you, bring you back to yourself, allow you to take care of yourself first in life. And I do not mean selfishly, I mean self first. A want is anything, you know. Let me give you an example. So I come home from work, I've had a big day, I'm tired and and uh, you know I'm you know it's a bit it's a bit messy the day's been messy I'm a bit all over the place and my partner says to me how was your day yeah yeah good 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 I don't say what I really need is actually I had a terrible day it was really hard I felt like the weight of the world was on my shoulders what I really need is a hug and a cup of tea would you make me a cup of tea I don't ask for that. What I do is I walk in and go, yeah, yeah, no, no, all good, good, yeah, it was a bit of a messy day, but never mind. And what I do is I go in, into my office and I get on the internet and I buy, you know, three pairs of shoes. Because I might want to buy three pairs of shoes. But my need will have been out there in the lounge room where I should have said, could you give me a cup of tea and a hug? Because that would have been coming back to myself. I'll feel fine for three minutes while I buy those three pairs of shoes and I might even feel great when I put them on my feet for the first time. But my need to be authentic with my partner and say I've had a really tough day, can I have a hug and a cup of tea? And sit with the discomfort of how I feel for a moment. That's a need. I hope that answers the question. Last question. Why does a love addict actively end up actively avoiding relationships completely? in later life? Well, that's an interesting question because I don't think love addicts do. I think love avoidance avoid relationships and they've hidden behind a wall of seduction. Love addicts will, as a general rule, continue to want to show up until they get into recovery and then they want to show up as the authentic person they are in the same way that love avoidance will cycle around look like they're very in the relationship but be absent look like they're in the relationship be absent and then cycle around so i think there's hope and um i hope it's been helpful it's a lot of information 
Uh, we need to wrap up now. I want to thank you all for staying and listening. That's been great. And um, love addiction, love avoidant workshops are being run one week a month at South Pacific Private. You can ring the intake team and have a chat with them about it. Uh, there are many other day programs that we run also uh, for all sorts of things and um, help is always available. So thank you very much and <laughs> very nice to have you all with me.